Which country is in the most debt? The governments of the world have accumulated over $100 trillion of... It's the United States. The USA has the most debt. America, the US, the United States of America, it has the most debt. Right now, the US has over $30 trillion and is growing. But come on, that's not really fair. Everything's bigger in America. The portion sizes, Walmart, suburbs, parking lots, and the size of its economy, which is the world's largest. So does this massive debt matter when it's also the world's leading economy? Does it? I don't know. Let's compare this debt to everything that was made in the USA, about $25 trillion in 2022, which gives us a debt of about 120% when anchored by this GDP. The USA owes more money than the money it makes in one year. But now that we've changed definitions, our top country has changed too. Two countries have consistently had the highest debt to GDP since 2010, Greece and Japan, both at over 200%. If every single euro earned in Greece were to be spent on debt repayment, an idea some Germans would die to see, then they wouldn't even pay off the debt after two years. Some people don't like this definition because debt is a stock and GDP is a flow, but I still think it's the best way to think of the debt since new debt is being taken out every year and debt is also being repaid every year. It's a lot more fluid than people think. The US spent almost half a trillion dollars, 8% of its budget, just paying back debt. At the same time, the government spent 1.4 trillion more than they collected in tax revenue, adding to the debt. In Japan, paying back debt wasn't just 8% of the budget, it was 23%. That's more than is spent on education, defense, public works, energy, food supply, and COVID relief combined. But wait, if the government can just take out debt to pay for the previous debt that's used to pay for another debt that was used to pay for debt, then what even is debt? Well, it's just an agreement between two parties, a lender and a borrower. Lender gives money to borrower with a time and says, pay me back by time. Oh, and also give me some more money, interest. So the borrower will either pay back the money plus interest by the end or the debt will be forgiven and the lender will raise their eyebrow, scoff, and never lend to them again. There are many different types of debts. We have credit, mortgages, corporate debt, household debt, student loans, but in this video we only care about public debt, debt that a government takes out in order to finance their governmental things. But unlike ordinary Joe Blow taking out a loan, government debt can mean the difference between helping millions of people or not. If Joe mismanages his loan and doesn't pay back, the bank says whatever and probably doesn't lend to him again. But if a government mismanages this debt and doesn't pay back, it could mean millions of people hurt out of jobs, financial help taken away, and future loans not given. Thousands of these individual loans are out in the world right now being paid and taken out every day called securities, government bonds, or since the Americans always have to be unique, T-notes, T-bonds, and T-bills. It's just a way that you, yes, you as a private citizen can finance government services while also getting some extra interest at the end. Anyone who holds these bonds owns a chunk of the government debt, so anyone can be a bondholder. But it usually gets picked up by boring financial things like banks, insurance companies, mutual funds, central banks, foreign investors, even other parts of the government to finance the debt through bonds. Notice the name of them though? Bond. Like, <laughs> We're friends now, Bond. You can trust me. But sometimes that trust is broken and that bond breaks. Like literally, the government can't pay it back. Some governments more consistently than others. Which is why there are global credit companies like SNP and Moody's who give each government a rating. A quite weird rating from D to BB plus to AAA. Triple A is considered prime, they'll basically always pay you back, and anything double B plus and below, it's given the lovely name of a junk bond. There's a good chance they won't pay you back. So not all debt is the same. Even though in 2021, both the UK and Sri Lanka had just over 100% debt to GDP, I'd rather take a British bond since they were rated AA, whereas Sri Lanka was given a CCC. Britain is just more likely to pay me back. So even though Japan has a mountain of debt, they still have an A plus rating. Pretty good. Greece with their mountain of debt though, it's a BB plus. Not good. The lower you are on this scale, the more likely you are to borrow from these guys, the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. They are international organizations who sometimes pool together the resource of nations to give a helping hand to struggling countries. Sounds lovely, right? Well, these people beg to differ, and so do they, and them too. Why are so many people protesting against the IMF? 
Well, there are a lot of different opinions in this wide world, and some people have more nationalistic ideas who like to reject any form of international interaction. No! Okay. Well, there's an extremely complex number of reasons a country could not be doing so well to the point where they need an emergency loan for relief, and blaming these organizations takes the blame off of their own bad decision. No! Gee, okay. While nationalism and scapegoating definitely play a role in IMF hate, the biggest reason could be restructuring. In order to take out a loan, they usually want to know they'll be paid back and they have the power to change your economic policies. After all, are you really not going to take a loan to help out your struggling people? Or more realistically, are you not going to take out this loan to stay in charge? Does this restructuring work though? Sometimes. Let's look quickly at the biggest receiver of IMF loans, Argentina. They've defaulted 9 times and have taken out 22 loans from the IMF. Now their debt sits at over $30 billion to the fund. In 2018, IMF funding came with subsidy cuts and lower spendings. That's not just a budget cut. For many, especially in a country with a history of poverty, it means pain. Dolor. Even when debt is fueled by government spending, the IMF still gets the blame for its ending. In 2001, after an economic collapse, the IMF straight up stopped lending to the nation. Argentina did not meet the IMF's conditionality for a loan. You can imagine how popular the fund was after that. Truth is, Argentina has flip-flopped too much between completely different economic systems, completely different levels of spending, and defaulted too many times to build up any sort of investor confidence right now. So until it can build that up, the IMF is still the most likely solution to their debt problems and will continue getting hated on for its restructurings. Still, outside of Argentina, debt is unpopular everywhere. Why should regular people suffer in order to restructure their government to something more trustworthy? And even if the government can pay it back, why should ordinary citizens be the ones to pay for it with their taxes? Almost everyone can agree, debt sucks. Mm -hmm. So here's something a little controversial. Debt can be really good. Our modern world is made on debt. Almost everyone, every company, and every government is in some sort of debt, and the world, as far as I can tell, has still been developing for the last couple centuries. That government debt in particular has some good uses. Here are four of them. One, much of the debt taken out in the USA was a result from two events, the Great Recession and COVID. Why? Because of these things, automatic stablers. Like those big dampers they put in buildings to stop them from shaking in an earthquake, these stabilizers will stop the economy from shaking too much in a recession. Systems like social security, unemployment insurance, food stamps, tax cuts for lower incomes, they automatically get used when people are doing worse without the government needing to really do anything, which automatically helps people stay spending and investing, and they automatically soften the crash at the expense of debt and they helped the 2008 financial crisis earn the name the Great Recession and not the Great Depression 2. 2. 2. 2. Trying to deal with the debt can make recovering harder, like here in Greece. After decades of racking up debt and misreporting their data to join the Eurozone, the country became a star when the financial system crashed in the late 2000s. Since it uses the same currency as major economies like France and Germany, European banks had given the small country hundreds of billions of euros in loans. If Greece fell, it wasn't too big of a jump to say the whole Eurozone could fall too, so the country was pressured into tough restructuring by the big players. When Greece tried out austerity in 2012, instead of the debt burden falling, it actually actually rose. Sure, spending less will make your debt go down, but if managed wrong, like in Greece, it can destroy confidence and investment. Businesses lost confidence and left, unemployment hit over 25%, over 50% for young Greeks, it wasn't uncommon for a whole family to live off of shrinking pension funds from a senior, pensions from a retirement age that was increasing, with severe tax increases and hundreds of thousands of educated Greeks fled the country. In short, austerity was more taxes for less services, which made the GDP fall. And if GDP falls faster than debt does, well, the debt burden rises, which can make the problem worse. By actually trying to cut debt back, you can create more of a problem, as Greece can tell you when it defaulted on its debt three years later. But I guess the alternative could have been an entire European bailout, so sorry to the young Greeks who were sacrificed for Europe. 3. Debt can bring real things, like physical, tangible, touchable objects. 
When 2008 hit China, as many as 30 million people lost their jobs. So instead of letting people get unrestful, China pursued the largest stimulus in history to that point, over half a trillion dollars or about one eighth of their entire 2008 GDP. Was it reckless? Maybe. Did they have to write off 20% of it as bad debt? Yeah. Did inflation hit the highest it had in decades? Yep. Could they have consistently spent this stimulus every single year? Absolutely not. Could it have been less about aiding the poor and more about flexing right ahead of the Beijing Summer Olympics? There sure is a chance. And could it have severely damaged their image if this debt went wrong? A hundred percent. But I'll tell you what it also made. New cities, earthquake relief, super highways, high speed internet, a more expansive coal network, take that how you will, and 10,000 kilometers of high speed Railways, baby. And now China has more high-speed rail than double the rest of the world combined. Even if the debt blows up in a major financial catastrophe, it's not going to unbuild this railway. Even if debt to high levels is unsustainable, this railway isn't going anywhere. And that's just an example. The US interstate system was financed mainly through government bonds too. And look at it today. Everyone loves it. So because of this reckless financial decision, now millions of Chinese citizens get to ride high speed rail. And look at you, riding the bus. Tch. Bet you wish you had high speed rail. 4. When you have nowhere else to invest, debt has your back. In a time where, you know, most businesses aren't performing too well, like a recession, you can invest your money into relatively safe debt. Many nations have never defaulted. That's not saying they never will default, but it means they've survived all economic catastrophes and can still pay back those bonds. A triple A bond can totally be a safe investment and debt can pay for good things. Why not help pay for these things when nothing else will give you a return? And hey, sticking your money into debt is better than just keeping it in cash in a bank account. But hold on, before you go crazy with your spending, debt can go wrong fast. At the end of the day, you still have to pay this debt back unless you want to be seen as untrustworthy and you don't want to be seen as that. So to deal with high debt, there are two options. You can one, pay it back or two, don't pay it back. Both are bad options. Let's start with paying it back. Remember that Japanese budget? Almost a quarter of it is spent on paying debt back. That's insane and it has had a real impact on how efficient the government is and played a role in Japanese stagnation for the past 30 years. But compared to some of those untrustworthy nations, that's nothing. In 2021, Zambia spent around 40% of their budget on debt repayment. How much did they spend on healthcare? 8%. This was coming at a time when the nation just defaulted on $11 billion of debt in 2020, having to take out one of those spooky IMF loans. And as a result, we're made to make some serious changes to the budget, like getting rid of fuel subsidies, which actually makes getting to those health and education centers for the poor are pretty much impossible. And some households have had to choose between food and medicine. And it's not just them. Worldwide, over 60 mostly lower income countries spend more of their budget on debt repayment than healthcare. For from Ghana to Lebanon to Pakistan. But the hope is that in the future with a good budget, they'll be able to increase spending on good things like health, infrastructure, and education. Sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't. Like Haiti who was born in debt. Literally, a $30 billion debt was given to France to recognize their independence in 1825. And throughout their history, there have been decades where half of their budget was dedicated to repaying debt. The IMF has given at least 30 loans to Haiti, still with little signs of getting better. Then there's the question of who actually pays for the debt. Let's say there was a country who took out many loans to pay for military and police which were used against ordinary civilians. Yes, I'm looking at you. Oh, and you too, I guess. What happens if there's a regime change? Who pays for the debt after? Spoiler alert, post-apartheid South Africa did take on the apartheid era's debt. And what if there's a dictator like Mobutu of Zaire who personally took over $4 billion for him and his boys while his population literally starved? Or Ferdinand Marcos of the Philippines. He took around $10 billion in loans for himself, leaving the Philippines with around $30 billion to repay. Why should the Congolese and Filipino people hurt themselves to pay for their dictators' greediness? The more corrupt a nation is, the harder it is to pay back. But a more corrupt nation usually has a harder time raising revenue because, you know, they have more tax evasion and whatnot, and thus needs more debt to finance growth. And the more corrupt the country, the harder it is to actually raise this debt since less people are willing to lend to you, even if that was in the past. More debt makes a less efficient government, but it's also a less efficient government that takes out more debt.
Paying off massive amounts of debt can be a terrible, terrible cycle with real effects on real people. So what if we just don't? Oh. Defaults are probably worse than being in a debt trap. The government won't just shrink its budget like with high debt, it could lose it entirely. Defaults can make education and healthcare literally shut down. The cost of living could skyrocket with even basic goods unaffordable. People will lose their jobs, businesses will shut down, and confidence will be lost making it much harder to finance future budgets. It's not a cute situation. Why can this happen? Sometimes the government can mismanage their debts, maybe misreport their income a little bit to look better to investors, and then struggle when everyone wants repayment. Sometimes restructuring after a previous default makes investors lose confidence in country and money coming in slows down which will make their budget harder to pay for. So defaults can lead to lost confidence which can lead to more defaults. Sometimes the debt you pay isn't even in your own currency. It could be in US dollars or Chinese yuan. If you were to lose your supply of that currency or, I don't know, have your currency depreciate by two times, it will make that foreign debt two times greater, which can, you know. Inflation can even cause it, which is funny since inflation actually makes debt smaller. The less a dollar is worth, the less $30 trillion of debt is. But to fight inflation, central banks usually raise interest rates and remember, you need to pay back that interest with your debt. So during the global interest rate hikes of 2022, seven different countries defaulted on their debt, the highest in a single year since the global interest rate hikes of the 1980s. And those defaults can spread to other countries like a plague. A speculation fueled plague. A splag. Let's go to the 1970s. During high oil prices, many oil exporters, now rich, believed Latin American debt was a safe investment for the future and with near 0% interest rates, rushed in to invest. Some American countries also predicted that oil would stay up so expanded operations now on debt to live large in the future. Latin America went from being in $30 billion of debt in 1970 to taking over $300 billion of it in 1982. Then the 1980s brought a fight against inflation, no matter the cost. Interest rates rose globally, oil prices spiked and then fell, and the world fell into a recession in 1981. And then in 1982, it happened. Mexico announced it couldn't pay back its $80 billion debt. Now the banks who lended were stressed. They wanted their money back. They shortened repayment times and took more interest. As countries struggled to pay, 15 other American countries were forced to reschedule their debt. They took on IMF and US help along with good old budget cuts and structural changes. Spending on health, infrastructure, and wages froze. Unemployment shot up. Inflation hit triple, no, quadruple digits, no, quintuple digits in different countries. Poverty grew as typical welfare shut down, inequality grew, and crime grew. This was the time when Mexican and Colombian cartels hit the international markets, baby. Great if you wanted cheap cocaine, but overall, very bad time in Latin American history. All caused by relying on a wave of international debt. So, does debt even matter? After that terrible story, you'd think yes, but remember, debt can bring very good things. In 1970s Latin America, governments took out that debt for the purpose of reducing poverty and stabilizing their countries. Those are great things, but it backfired when they took out too much of it. So my answer has to be yeah. yeah. That's yes and no at the same time. If debt can be good for a while, but high levels of debt suddenly turn bad, then there must be a point where it gets too high. Here's a list of studies asking that very question. You can see it comes with this very wonderful graph. Growth goes up with debt, but oh no, there's a threshold and suddenly starts going down. Very rigorous, very mathematical. Where that threshold is, who knows? 70%, 77%, 85%? The most famous study says 90% is when it gets too high. Some split it up for advanced economies and developing. Others found absolutely no correlation between debt and growth at all. The key to debt is probably just the key to life, confidence. Truth is, debt is fine as long as you can reliably pay it back, and as long as you can convince everyone you can pay it back, usually by not defaulting. Doesn't it say something when three of the countries with the most debt, the US, Japan, and Italy, are all advanced rich economies? 
Greece and China too, despite what people say, are still decently rich nations even if they're also in tons of debt. As long as you have that confidence, you can take out debt to create growth. It just comes to a trade-off between now and the future. That's not saying you can always create growth with debt. Confidence is a very delicate thing to balance. Just don't get to a point where you can't pay it back and you lose that confidence. Oh, shit.